want to purchase that book afterwards, you can do that. Okay? Everybody said? Amen. All right. Let's turn in your Bibles to Daniel. Daniel chapter 1. We're going to start a new series, 10-week series, called Staying in Touch in an Out-of-Touch World. We're going to learn from the life of the prophet Daniel. Daniel's one of my favorite guys in the Old Testament. I love him. I don't know that I was named after him, but I love his, I love his life. We have a world or a culture, and friends, I really do want to talk about this for just a little while. We are primarily going to deal with the culture that we live in because we're going to see that Daniel lived in a foreign culture. We live in a foreign culture. It's not a we-they mentality. It's just that it used to be built on Christian uh, Judeo principles, and it's just fastly uh, fleeting away from us. And so we have to come back to realize that there are ways that you and I can live in this world. We have a world or a culture that wants you to hook up to its agenda and ride with it. We must be certain as to what we allow in our lives so it won't take us in a direction we never intended for our lives. Have you ever done that? Hooked up with something and you go, wait a minute, I want to put the brakes on here because this is not what I intended. Well, I found a story for you that kind of has that, uh, that implication. Listen to this. It happened at a traffic light near the edge of town. A man gunned the engine of his huge Harley Davidson motorcycle as he waited for the light to change. You might have been tempted to stare at this guy and he would have enjoyed it. A filthy rag was fastened around his head. From beneath it, a matted tangle of gray hair spilled down the back of his leather jack jacket. Uh, Images of skulls and bones leered from his clothing and his bare forearms. And his bike bore the emblem of a menacing black widow spider. As he waited at the light, an elderly man on a lime green moped pulled up beside him. <laughs> the ringy ding ding of the moped was drowned out by the roaring thunder of the Harley. R -R. <laughs> Boy, that sub motorcycle you got there, the old man choked. Man, if I take a, mind if I take a closer look at it? Scowling from behind his oily beard, the biker gave him a once-over. If it turns your crank, old-timer, he snarled, go ahead. The old man was a little farsighted, but he wanted to take it in all the scenery, so he leaned his face right over the bike and examined every inch of it. Looking up after a while, the old man grinned and said to the biker, I bet that motorcycle goes really fast. But no sooner were the words out of his mouth, the light changed, and the biker thought, I'd show this old geezer what a real chopper can do. He gave it a full throttle, and within 30 seconds, the speedometer read 199 miles an hour. He chuckled with satisfaction. Suddenly, he noticed a dot in his rearview mirror. A dot was growing larger. Something was gaining on him. What could it be? He slowed down to get a better look, and whatever the thing was, it flashed past him so fast he couldn't identify it. The thing disappeared over the horizon, whipped around, and came right back at him. As it zipped past, he recognized the rider. It was the old man on the lime green moped. How could this be? The biker took another look into the rearview mirror. There was the speck again coming in his way, growing larger. The biker tried to turn, run away from it, but he couldn't be done. It was a moot point, for in the seconds the moped slammed into the rear of the Harley Davidson. The uh, collision destroyed both bikes. You could hear the impact for miles. The biker extracted himself from the mangled steel pretzel that had once been his beloved Harley Davidson, but the old man had fared even worse. He lay groaning beneath the black smoking remnants of the moped. Even the hardened biker was moved with compassion. He knelt beside the old man's face and softly asked, Is there anything I can do for you? The old man choked and coughed, replied, Yes. Could you please unhook my suspenders from your handlebars? Be careful what you get involved in. It may take you someplace you don't want to go. <laughs> Daniel life takes an unexpected turn. He is raised in Judah with a promising future, career, and a family. Family. Daniel is living in Judah during the time of the exile when King Nebuchadnezzar seizes his country and takes them captive. Daniel is now in a foreign land, learning a foreign culture, language, and his dreams are really a heap of ashes. 
There are different individuals in the scriptures that find themselves doing something totally foreign to their dreams. I don't know about you, but I think that there, all of us have found those curves in life when it takes us someplace we don't want to go. The Apostle Paul comes to my mind. Here's a guy that really has a future, and then it, it, sovereignly, in the will of God, he finds himself in the middle of a prison. And I'm sure there are times that, that Paul is asking himself, what in the world am I doing here? You know, this is an unexpected turn. But in the sovereignty of God's grace, in the sovereignty of God's thinking, actually we become benefactors of what the Apostle Paul's life was all about because largely of his writings come to us in the New Testament. It would have never happened unless he'd been in prison. You see? Now here's the question that comes to you. Do you find yourself being faced with a curveball that life has thrown you that you really didn't expect? Something that's going on in your life that you just didn't believe was going to happen to you. And yet you find yourself in this kind of a situation and it's kind of like, I didn't know that I was going to go through a divorce. I didn't know that I, my, my, my finances were going to go down the tubes. Uh -huh. I didn't know that that uh, cherished loved one of mine was going to die so early. I didn't know that I was going to uh, be diagnosed with this kind of a disease. And, and see, life just has this ability to take us down a path that we just wonder how in the world did we actually even get to this place. Well, that's exactly where Daniel is. Daniel is in a place in his life that he never, ever saw it coming. Daniel was in a place when, when King Nebuchadnezzar came in and he had his future in front of him, but now it's made this incredible turn and he's going, what in the world is going on in my life? What is happening to my life? Do you find yourself living in Babylon in a place where you never expected to be? Daniel was. Daniel surrounded by a culture that was going to exert every influence upon him to change his values and who he was. Years ago, I read a book called Man is Moral Choice. And this professor actually from Princeton diagnoses the whole case that's going on in our society today, and he asks the question, is man mollable? In other words, does, does man have any kind of free will to go against the, uh, the environment that he's living in? And friends, I want you to hear something. I'll come back to this in just a moment. Uh, we have social engineers within our, our uh, country today that really say these three things. Man is a product of his environment, man is a product of his education, and man is a product of his, inherit or his uh, heredity. And we really kind of get to a place within our own culture that we, we start listening to what the culture scientists say about us, and we really kind of feel like they're hopeless. We kind of feel like our whole agenda, our whole life is uh, already predisposed and we really don't have a whole lot of choices in the matter. And Daniel becomes a real uh, person, a real model for us to say, you know, my life can go in a different direction than what the environment says or what my culture says or even what my heredity says. I can go in a different way. And I, I want us to see this thing from, from a standpoint as we go through it in this next 10 weeks that we really get a grasp that the major area that you and I are dealing with in our lives is really a, a cultural phenomena with media, with, uh, with things that direct our lives and take us maybe someplace that we never really intended to go. Babylon, interesting to, to note, the word Babylon means, listen to this, spiritual confusion. Spiritual confusion. We are living in a time, friends, when there's a lot of spiritual confusion. People don't know where they came from, they don't know who they are, and they don't know where they're going. And there's a reality that's taking place in our culture today that a lot of people are still asking the question, who am I? What am I on the planet for? But Daniel becomes, now listen to this, friends, Daniel becomes a model for us, not only one who survives a culture that's just anti-God, but he teaches us how to thrive. 
See, I don't know about you, and I, I go along with this, this particular statement. It's really not how we start, it's how we finish. See, and, it's, and Daniel becomes a model for us to look at and say, you know, here's somebody that went against the culture, that did something that not only affected his life, but actually affected the whole kingdom. Because he had chosen in his heart that I'm not going to go the way of the Babylonians. So if you have your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 1, let's read a few verses here, and then we'll go through our outline. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasures of the house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were there to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these, from the Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to devile himself. And this is an important verse here. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to devile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to devile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Dave, Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my Lord, the king, who has signed your food and drink. Why should he uh, see you looking worse than other men your age? The king then would have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men uh, who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. And at the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away. Now, this should have made Daniel a real popular guy. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they would drink and to give them the vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. If you have your little outlines, you want to follow along, let's take a look at five ways to thrive in Babylon. Five ways to thrive in Babylon. Number one is this. Refuse to become a victim. Refuse to become a victim. Verse 5, the king assigned to them a daily amount of food and wine for the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's servants. A victim's mentality really surrenders any kind of hope for a changed life. This is the way it will be. There's nothing I can do about it. Daniel was pretty hopeless. He was in a hopeless situation, but he never gave in to a victim's mentality. Let me talk to you about a victim's mentality. As a ma matter of fact, Daniel is a guy that is not being changed by outward influences on his life, but rather by inward forces. Daniel is not succumbing to Babylon. He is being changed by an inward force. Now, I want you to think about this for a little while, uh, because we talked about social engineering, and so I think it's really important for us to understand and I don't mean this from some kind of a political angle tonight, but I want you to know this, that if you think that you can change a person by just changing his environment, in, in, in the finest definition of the term, you are a liberal. And I don't mean that in the context of what we call in, in politics. This, it means this, change their environment and you can change the kid. But let me tell you something about that. Because I can tell you about a perfect environment. I can tell you one that was, was, had no evil in it. And all of you are thinking about the Garden of Eden. But it was heaven. And somebody chose out of that. 
and said, you know, I'm not going to live this way and responded in a different way towards that environment. As a matter of fact, I can tell you, and this goes on both sides of the issue here, you have people within Christendom today that basically says if we create a good environment in our home, if we create a good environment in our church, and we create a good environment in our school, then we're going to produce really healthy kids. And friends, I want you to know there are a lot of rebellious kids that come out of those kind of situations. Because environment in and of itself does not say to an individual, so therefore you're going to be okay. And then it can be on, on the, the other side. People can live in all sorts of negative influences and environments in their life, and they can basically stand up and say, you know, I'm not going to live that way. And so they don't develop a victim's mentality. And uh, I'm really concerned about our culture today. Because there is so much of this teaching about victimhood. I'm a victim. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't real victims. But lots of times what happens to us, and the reason we never, ever counter the culture that we're living in, live in a counterculture in the culture that we're living in, is simply because we have bought the social engineering that basically says you're predisposed to be the way that you are. And we start buying into a system that is from Babylon that says but I have a better influence on your life than God. See, uh, I don't know, you know, in the 70s when we were in Afghanistan and we came back home, there was a word that everybody was using over there. And actually, I never heard it in America until I got back home and it was some time later and actually it was in kind of the educational uh, community and it was the word karma. And now karma is everywhere. How's your Karma. And, and see, the idea of it is, is there is something that is influencing your life and taking you someplace, and there's nothing you can do about it because this influence in your karma. Actually, you know, the first time I ever heard the word karma, I was thinking of karma gear. <laughs> I had no idea of what people were talking about, you know. But we've got to come to a place and realize that Daniel really becomes a, a model for us not to have a victim's men mentality. Surround it manipulated, controlled, and everything else. And he just stands up and says, it's not going to have that kind of control on me. Number two is this. Don't allow Babylon to change your identity. Well, now here's a big one. The chief official gave them new names. Listen to this in Daniel 8.1. In the third year of King Belshazzar's, I, Daniel, had a vision. Now, this is quite some time while he's in Babylon, and he goes, my name is still Daniel. You can call me whatever you want to call me, but I am still Daniel. Now, I think that's really huge. Daniel did not allow this name to distract from who he was. We allow our culture to determine who we are because, now get a hold of this, most people don't like who they are. See, we look at somebody else. And we looked at their gifting. As a matter of fact, it happens in the church. We look at somebody else and go, oh, man, if I could just be like her, or if I could just be like him, if I could just have his gift. And the reason why we fall prey to this, friends, is simply because we don't like who we are. And, there, you know, and it's just a phenomena that goes around is that most people really don't, they don't even like who they are, they really don't even know who they are. And here's where the problem comes in Babylon and putting our identity in, in Babylon. See, you, uh, because we live in a celebrity type of uh, culture today, we have people that are going around, they look at a celebrity and go, oh, if I could just be like them. But how many of us know about the 15-minute rule? They're only in the spotlight for what? 15 minutes. And then if you've modeled your life after them and now they're not, uh, quote, popular anymore, then what happens to your identity? It goes away. You know, uh, John, in one of the books of the Bible, John, 1 John, it says this, uh, the world is, now notice this, passing away. Everything in the world today is passing away. That means this. If I put my identity in the world, what's going to happen to it? 
It's going to pass away. As a matter of fact, let me ask you this question. If I would come up to you tonight and ask you this question, uh, who are you? What would be your response? See, and I think most of us would respond with, this is what I do. You know, uh, I'm defined by what I do. You're defined by what you do. But is that really our image? Uh, I know this is going to be hard on, on Ron, a worship leader, but I really don't care. Uh, <laughs> the Oakland Raiders went through a devastating Super Bowl loss here a few years ago, and, and we were devastated by that. For Ronnie, not for the team. But anyway, uh, their quarterback in an interview, uh, Gannon, was given this interview, and he said... Uh, being a quarterback is what I do, but it doesn't define who I am. And friends, there's something about us in our, in our spirit. God is spirit. He created your spirit. And he's jealous over that spirit. And he does not want the mark of Babylon on your spirit. Uh, see, everybody talks about the, uh, you know, the mark of the beast. And the mark of the beast is 666. And I really think the mark of the beast really has a lot to do. And of course, you, can, you don't have to agree with this. But the mark of the beast has a lot to do with, uh, does Babylon have its mark on your spirit? Where's your identity? And see, when we put our identity in God, it never changes. And the greatest revelation that you and I will ever, ever have in our life is that you are a son or a daughter of the living God because that will never, ever change. You see? Understand that. Number three. Resolved to live within God's value system. Verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to devile himself with royal food or wine. Daniel resolved in his heart. There were certain values that he would not violate. We need to declare what hill we will die on. And we need to declare it ahead of time. Uh, let me talk to you about this for just a moment. There are issues in the church. As a matter of fact, there are issues that we have on staff when it comes to... Uh, Doctrinal differences. Let me tell you about one. Uh, you know, some people on our staff believe in a pre-trip. I don't. But there's people, you know, within the church that believe Jesus is coming back before the tribulation. Some people are believing he's coming back in the middle of the tribulation. And then there's some people that are believing he's coming back uh, post-tribulation. They're a post-tribulationist. And then we even have what we call all millennialists. I myself am a pan-millennialist and I believe everything will pan out. All right. Um, but but here's, here's, here's the point, is that uh, I would never die on that hill. I would just simply never die on that hill because it's not worth dying on. But you need to declare as to which hill you will die on because if you have not decided that, the influences of Babylon at the time of temptation are too great for you and you will find yourself falling for something because you haven't declared it ahead of time. For instance, values within uh, business practices. I will take a shortcut here and then only to find out that you have destroyed yourself because you have taken a shortcut when at the time your integrity was telling you, don't do that. Don't go there. But that's the influence of Babylon. Babylon. Daniel stood up and says, these are my values. This is where I'm going to stand. See, so here's, here's another thing that destroys people is, uh, you know, a little one-night stand isn't going to hurt me. I can just kind of mess around out there and, nothing's going to, and then find out that uh, your life is destroyed because Babylon has had an influence upon you. Here's another thing that you can think about this is that uh, at some point, you and I just have to, declare our values, and then resolve within ourselves we're going to do what we know is right to do. See, some of you here have said, you know, I really want a relationship with God, but you've never, ever made that kind of a commitment. Some of you here have said, you know, I really want to develop an inner life, but you've never started a quiet time. Some of you here know you have giftings and say, uh, you know, someday I'm really going to commit myself to the church. I don't want to live out of value, but you've never, ever made that kind of resolve 
in your heart. And I think tonight, for some of us, we need to resolve in our hearts that, you know, I'm really going to commit my life to Christ. Uh, you know, we, we play for all the marbles here every weekend where people are going to spend eternity. And some of you have been vacillating back and forth between that decision. And, and some of you need to know that uh, these unexpected terms, uh, turns in life, and I'm not trying to preach any kind of manipulation or fear or anything like this, come at times when we just didn't expect it. And if you sense God speaking to your heart, then tonight's a good night to resolve. I'm going to start living by some values and not just picking up whatever goes through in Babylon and living by that. Number four is this. Expect to encounter God's grace. I love this verse, verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. Expect to encounter God's grace. Daniel, Daniel exhibited a great deal of faith in God by even suggestion such a departure from protocol. I don't want to eat your food. I mean, that's never been heard of. He says, I don't want to eat your food. As a matter of fact, there, there's even a grace that has been uh, exhibited in Daniel, the way that he speaks to this official that shows you that God's on the scene. And let me just say this to you, friends. None of us can live in Babylon without God's grace upon our lives. Uh, I've, I've described anybody that tries to define the boundaries of God's grace as either at the height of arrogance or the depth of stupidity. Because we don't know uh, the boundless uh, portions of God's grace in our lives. And I believe that God's grace encounters us when we, when we don't deserve it. But I've been working on something. And I want you to hear this through tonight. I really believe that God's grace is exhibited in a greater dimension when it's found in the area of obedience. And what Daniel was doing here is he was being obedient. Now, I've had grace explain, explained to me a lot of different ways, but the best definition I can give you of grace is this. Grace means light and power, which means this. God gives us light to understand the situation, and then he gives us power to do what's right. Unmerited favor. God's grace comes upon us. So you're coming. Let me ask you this question. How many of you are facing really some, uh, some really tension-filled decisions and you just don't know what to do? A lot of people. What do you do? You ask for God's grace. But God is not going to give you light and power for something that's going to lead you down a path where he doesn't want you to go. And lots of times, even God will lift his grace from you to let you know that you're going down wrong. As a matter of fact, the reason why God won't give you uh, grace in a situation where you know you're going to be going wrong, and again, I'm, I'm working on this, it'd be like handing uh, the keys to a liquor store to somebody that you know is a confirmed alcoholic. That is not grace, that is stupidity. See, and God is going to give grace to people that are saying, okay, God, I'll do it your way. I won't do it my way. And maybe it's where I am in my own personal life of saying, uh, how do you receive this grace? See, and I really think that that's the key here. To live in Babylon, I need to see God working in my life. So how do I receive this grace when I get into a situation where it's a little bit gray and I really don't know what to do? God, how do I receive this? And, and I, I, th I, think, uh, I think there's a whole series on this one. But can I just tell you what, what little bit I have right now is that I really believe that God's grace is directed towards people that are looking for it and are willing to receive it and are saying and surrendered to a point of saying, God, uh, whatever you show me, I'll do. Thinking correctly. See, Daniel was thinking correctly and receives the grace, sees the manifestation of God's grace as he comes down upon this official and says, okay, we'll do it your way. That's grace. See, some of you are in situations tonight and you need to see God's grace. See, I love to talk about God like this because he's not a God way out there. See, and I, as I've said in this church many a times, most people in America today are deists. They believe in a God that's way out there, but they don't believe that a God that really wants to encounter you. And I love to talk about a God that wants to encounter you because that's what he does. See, and he begins to show himself. He begins to reveal himself. 
God's alive. He speaks in people's lives today, and he does things like he did for Daniel. Number five is this. Battle the desire to isolate yourself. Battle the desire to isolate yourself. When you live in Babylon, you will not survive outside authentic community. Daniel and his three friends prayed together, studied together, grew together, and dealt with issues together. James uh, Stockdale, I believe his name is, is a Vietnam vet that spent 2,714 days as a POW in a Vietnam uh, prison camp. 2,714 days. And he really has a tremendous explanation and definition between somebody that's a person of faith and somebody that's an optimist. And a person that's an optimist sets a date out here and says, by that date I'm going to be delivered. But a person of faith doesn't deal with the date, he just knows he's going to be delivered. And he said, the optimist never made it. Only the people with faith. They were trying to get information out of this guy. And, so, and we're talking about authentic community here. And Daniel would have never made it without authentic community, without these other three guys. How are we going to get through this situation? Um, they took him outside, this James Stockdale, and put him in the blistering sun for three days and beat him. Every time he'd start to go to sleep, they beat him unmercifully. And he said, at this point, I, I, I just gave up hope. It's like, uh, I can't deal with this anymore. I just can't do it. And they had worked out a signal system because they could not talk to one another. So they had figured out a code, like a Morse code, and when they would sweep, they would hit it in certain paths and dots and stuff that uh, let the other prisoners know that there was some kind of communication going on and they could, they could communicate this way. And tired and beaten, uh, he was taken back to his prison cell and he was going by, a guy pops out a message to Jim Stocksdale and it said, uh, God bless you, Jim Stocksdale. And he said, those words saved my life. Authentic community, friends. All of us are going to face some really difficult times. And what the enemy wants to do is he wants to isolate you from authentic community. I watched a uh, Discovery Channel. It's becoming one of my favorite channels. And this was years ago, and, and they showed the Alaskan wolf. And what the Alaskan wolf does is he'll watch the caribou come, and then he'll, in a pack, they will station themselves about a mile apart. And then what they'll do is they'll, and, and scientists still don't even know this, they will run into the herd, and they will find the weakest one, and then they'll begin to isolate him, and then they'll just nip him on there, and they'll begin to bleed a little bit. And about the time this one tires out, the next one will take over and nip him again until they've got him so isolated from the herd that he has absolutely no chance. And then the whole pack of wolves jump on him. I hate to say this, but I've seen that happen to a lot of Christians. Start getting isolated. And one of the ways that Daniel stayed in, you know, his value system, continued to live with God is simply because he practiced authentic community. Friends, I can't overstate this enough. If you're going to live in Babylon, you got to have friends. You got to have friends that you can trust. You got to have friends that say, sit down with you and go, you know, I really don't understand this issue. What do you think? And it's by that kind of connection. It's by that kind of it reinforcement. Yeah, you can do this. And just the support of one another takes us to another level that we live and not only survive, but thrive in Babylon. Let's stand together. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, I ask this evening that as... Uh, As we start this series and starting this, uh, this summer months, 
would you would you increase our understanding about what it is to live in Babylon? Would you even uh, grace us, Lord, with a desire to really kind of pour over this book in our own uh, in our own times, so that we can understand how Daniel really became a force for you in an ungodly culture. And so I ask, as your Holy Spirit is here, and as you begin to form things in our hearts, uh, that you would make us available to your promptings to say, not only can you survive, but you can thrive in the culture that we live in. And so I ask, Lord, as we worship you now, that you would seal the words that you have spoken into our hearts, that we can be uh, transformed like Daniel was. We're going to worship the Lord, and as you worship the Lord, I want you to do business with God. Worship the Lord together. Place my trust. Do not let me yeah, be put to shame. Don't let my enemy triumph over me. My hope is you. Show me your way. Lord, I am, O oh Lord, filled with your love. You are, O oh God, my salvation. Oh, and God, my life and rescue me. Yeah. My broken spirit child, my mended heart cries out, my hope in you, show me your way, guide me in truth, in all my days. In you, oh God, I place my trust. Do not let me yeah, be put to shame. Don't let my enemy triumph over me. Oh, and God, my life and rescue me, yeah. My broken spirit child, a mended heart cries out. My hope is you. Show me your way. Show me your way. 
forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit It's my 
Lord Jesus, that's what we want to do tonight. And uh, I would ask that a gentle rinsing, like a gentle...
all who are weary Come to the rock Come to the fountain And all who have sailed On the rivers of heartache Come to the sea Come and be set free
Good evening again, and welcome again to all of you. It's communion weekend. We do this the last weekend of the month here at the Vineyard.